Bill, can I interrupt you for a hot Absolutely. second? Absolutely. Are we recording? We are indeed. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, and thank you to whoever um, signaled that reminder uh, at home. Uh, so this is Niccolo uh, Pascolo. He's a Venetian. I was born in Greece. Um, he lamented that um, the oligarchs and monarchs in Venice um, were as retrograde and conservative as they were. He encouraged Napoleon to take over uh, Venice to um, forward uh, his progressive aims. And, you know, uh, many of us in the restaurant business and many of us in DC, which, you know, voted 90% against the current, um, you know, occupier of the White House, um, share his pain in forwarding a progressive agenda. So uh, without further ado, this is to the evening. Perhaps because you are the image of that fatal quiet so dear to me, you have come, O oh, evening, and when happy summer clouds and the gentle west wind are your escort, and when from snowy restless heights you send shadows and darkness into the world, you descend summoned always and gently hold the secret ways of my heart, secret ways of my heart, it should be said. You make my thoughts wander forms that vanish into eternal nothing. Meanwhile, this cursed time flees and with it the throng of cares with which it me destroys. And while I gaze on your peace, that warlike spirit sleeps and yet within me roars. Um, and I love that tone of, uh, of resignation um, but, you know, nonetheless, um, you know, perseverance and, and protest and, you know, that inner uh, warrior uh, spirit. And I think that's something that, you know, Lambrusco embodies um, as a, a wine of place, as a wine that um, was a victim of its own success in the 70s and 80s, um, that fell flat on its face and that was debased fundamentally and that people came to associate with these mass market brands and is, you know, once again, coming back um, into its own. So. Um, I'm going to bring my color commentator into the mix as, as quickly as I can, but I'm um, just going to give you a brief, um, you know, kind of overview of the region. So first and foremost, I think it's important to understand that we are in the culinary heart of Italy. So um, Emilia Romagna, um, you're appending the names of two provinces. So you have uh, Emilia, which constitutes this bit to the west, and Romagna, named after the old Roman road um, to the east, uh, abutting the Adriatic. And uh, look at all this amazing food stuff. These are all DOCs. These are all designations of origin for amazing foods in Emilia Romagna. And, you know, you're kind of uh, abutting the um, northern regions of Italy, the Alps here. You have the Apennines, um, the central spine of Italy, which runs kind of, you know, north to uh, south and east uh, in the southern area of the region. Um, and, you know, you get this convergence of these more Mediterranean influences and more continental influences. Um, you have, you know, olive oil, you have, you know, butter, you have parm, you have balsamic, you have mortadella, you have, you know, bolognese, you have white asparagus, you have truffles, you have, you know, any and all cured meats you could conjure. It is, you know, the gut of Italy. You know, it is everything you want to be eating personified essentially um, in one, you know, kind of Valhalla-ish region. Um, and, you know, naturally, you know, you're going to want to, you know, dial things down a little bit in terms of what you drink with all that stuff. So um, it stands to reason that when you reach for a red wine, you don't want, you know, Cali Cab. You want something a little more refreshing, uh, which is where Lambrusco comes to uh, the fore. And um, important to understand about Lambrusco, we are talking about red wine with bubbles. Uh, historically, um, it was uh, a lightly fizzy red wine re-fermented in bottle, and uh, it was, you know, mostly dry. I think most people don't understand that sweet wine as we know it, um, it's really a modern uh, creation. Um, uh, there are a couple things you need to make a sweet wine that is chemically stable in the bottle. You know, first and foremost, you can add sulfur. Um, so historically to, you know, dessert wines, it would add quite a bit of sulfur or you need sterile filtration. Um, and these are things that didn't exist, you know, on a large scale until, you know, well after World War I and World War II throughout the world. So, you know, much of what we take for granted about these products that we, you know, think of as sweet, be it, you know, um, you know, Riesling or, you know, something like Lambrusco, um, you know, the, historically they weren't that way. They've only become that way um, in the modern era and after World War II when, you know, globally people wanted to be drinking sweet things. Um, Lambrusco is a designation of origin. It is a point of origin um, for, you know, this very special fizzy wine, but it is also a family of grapes. Um, and these are, you know, the, the cheap, um, you know, kind of 
uh, brothers and sisters for the sake, or cousins, uh, for the sake of the Lambrusco family. Should be said, you're dealing with a very ancient family of grapes, um, you know, so ancient that it could be descended from wild vines and could potentially put the lie to the Georgian claim that, you know, uh, Vitis vinifera was only first domesticated uh, in Transcaucasia, but neither here nor there. There are over 60, 70 different sub-varietals of um, Lambrusco. Um, the word itself um, essentially means wild vine um, in Latin. Some of the most important that we're going to talk about, Sorvara, it's the most widely grown in the region, uh, is uh, cultivated uh, more broadly on the wild kind of like um, flat plains of the Po River Valley. Um, Lambrusco as a grape was famed since antiquity um, for its, you know, huge yields. Uh, Cato the Elder talks about, you know, half an acre filling 300 plus uh, and four worth of wine. So, uh, and in the modern era, you, you talk about people, you know, um, operating with, you know, 200 hectoliters per hectare of, of, you know, yields, which is ridiculous. You know, in Bordeaux, the max is 50. To make good wine, you know, you have to limit yourself to 30, um, you know, 20, 25. Uh, and, you know, so just cartoonishly massive amounts of wine um, on a commercial scale. Um, and, you know, uh, it was very much a commodity um, in the modern era. And it's only, you know, recently within the last couple of decades that people have started to reclaim it as an artisanal product. And uh, Sorbara is the ubiquitous kind of like most widely, or should be said rather Salamino, not Sorbara, um, the most uh, widely grown of the bunch. Um, Grasparoso is the most tannic of the bunch. It is the grape of the hills. Um, it is uh, densely uh, kind of structured, um, you know, more gripping in terms of the tannins. Sorbara, which I misidentified as the most widely grown, is actually the prettiest of the bunch. And it flowers very unevenly, um, which has a natural diminishing effect on the yields. Um, and uh, we have a Lambrusco de Sorbara here. It's a very special, pretty um, kind of uh, you know, subtype of Lambrusco, which is well worth celebrating. And then Maestri figures um, throughout, prominently throughout the region um, as well. Um, you know, uh, what is really fun about uh, Lambrusco more broadly um, is that it belongs to this even broader family of um, sparkling wines from Emilia Romagna. And the diversity is, is really staggering, um, you know, I find. You know, you're not just dealing with Lambrusco, um, which occupies the central provinces of um, Emilia Romagna. You're also dealing with, from uh, east to west, um, a broader swath of what the Italians call these vivace sparkling wines. So um, you can see, um, this is Emilia Romagna, but uh, in the foothills of the um, kind of low Alps um, and higher Alpen uh, Apennines in Piacenza, you have Giutonio Frizzante, you have Sparkling Barbera, and then further closer to the Adriatic coast, you have Pignoletto and all sorts of other grapes. So there's this whole family of these historically lightly effervescent wines that are predominant throughout the region that are just now coming back to the fore and people are just starting to celebrate. And, you know, they are truly gastronomic wines. Um, I love this quote um, from uh, the seminal um, American importer, Louis Dressner. Um, he says that on the one hand, you have all this history and tradition associated with Lambrusco, but on the flip side, these are wines that are designed to be consumed fairly quickly within a culture that loves eating and drinking. So you can almost turn off your mind and enjoy them in the moment. So, um, you know, they offer whatever you want of them. They can be, you know, fresh and fun, or they can be, you know, profound and multifaceted. And, and you know, that's really, you know, my entry point um, for the sake of them. Uh, Brent Kroll, um, what was your, um, it should be said that Brent, um, you know, in his former position at Neighborhood Restaurant Group, celebrated Lambrusco with a, a full week, or was it a full month of uh, Lambrusco? We did a whole week and it was basically because my employer was like, hey, what do you think about restaurant week? And I was like, hey, I like Lambrusco this time of the year in the summer. So it's, uh, I came up with 10 by the glass. They all paired with different types of charcuterie. And this is like the, one of the best things for like the lazy man pairing. Sometimes people talk about like composing this intricate dish and pairing it up with this wine with nuances. Lambrusco, it's just like a plug and play, like zero calorie effort pairing. You get a stick of salami or chorizo, you open a bottle of Lambrusco and you're like ready to rock. So, I mean, it's taking like one of the simplest principles of like, you know, kind of what grows together goes together. And in this area, uh, to get on a little rant too, um, Salamino is a grape. They named it after salami because it takes on a salami type form. 
uh, Bologna, the capital, is it referred to or it translates to the fat one. So this isn't like your vodka soda. This isn't like your <laughs> like a place in the world. They're literally just want they want you to basically you know double fist. And when you double fist, it is not flutes. It's not even wine glasses. There it is, is cups of meat and cups of lambrusco. So you're double fisting with cups of both because they both work well in a cup. And when you walk around and it's warm there and you saw that map and what you're eating and drinking, Lambrusco is also the regional pairing for the meat sweats. So when you get the meat sweats and it's hot out and it's the summer, that's, that's I mean, what I tell people it pairs with all the time. Um, now to your point too, in like the 70s and 80s, a lot of times people know there was like a sweet Chenin Blanc craze. There was pe people calling like cooking wine, like champagne and Chablis. There was like the Lancers. There was the... Uh, uh, what is that? Matus. There's there, there Blue Nun. There's all yeah. the all the stuff out there. So Rianiti uh, in that category was like the Muhammad Ali of those. It was dominating for two decades in the U.S. It paved the way for bullshit like Yellowtail and Cupcake to follow. It basically um, just was people having just like sugar buzzes. It was like the old school way to like you know. I guess it kind of paved the way even for stuff like flavored Moscato. And if you ever wonder why, like, drinking, like, margarita mix gives you a blistering headache, I mean, Rianiti and that can share, like, kind of a common thread with a bunch of, like, processed sugar just being dumped in. Um, when old school Italians, when they look at Lambrusco and they want to see if it's real, they actually look and they look at the alcohol percentage. And if they see the alcohol percentage is under 11, um, this, this is just old school. This isn't like something you read out of a book or fact. They consider them leaving too much sugar in the wine, and they, they consider that not to be, like, you know, the secco that they, they want it to be. It's not to say that Lambrusco with sugar is like bad. I honestly think you can get around like 20 grams where you barely even taste it when you get into tannic variety, like tannic examples, because the acid and tannin kind of hide the sugar. So even sometimes like not quite to the extent of Riesling, I would say, but like a little bit of sugar just balances the wine in a lot of cases. Like I don't think like the Natura style is like making a lot of sense for Lambrusco. Like you got to push the fruit like uh, a little bit. Um, but that that is my my Robin's here, Batman for Lambrusco Rams. So, uh, Kroll, what was your kind of road to Damascus moment with Lambrusco as, you know, everybody hates restaurant week. Um, and so it was, a, it was a natural pivot, you know, to say to your employer, like, you know, great, I'll do restaurant week, but I'm going to drive sales on this wine that no one will reflexively buy anyway. You know, that was a great, you know, Brent Kroll kind Good. of uh, punk yeah, rock song great. moment. But, you so, know, what was your you know, you taste a bottle, you think to yourself, holy hell, this is amazing. I should be, you know, actively, you know, fanboying this. But when I, when I started Lambrusco Week there, I think it was like, God, I think it was about six, maybe five, six years ago. And that time in the market, there weren't a lot of good Lambruscos. And I was already doing Iron Gate and I was seeing that like, wow, I can get stuff brought into the city if the city doesn't have good representation in this category. So I was like, wow, the representation for good Lambrusco is pretty shitty in DC right now. So I did it and it was wanting to avoid restaurant week. And it's one of those things where like, you're so stubborn to prove a point that like you had a good idea. I was like, I did like service every single day. I was like telling everyone about it. I was saying like, come by. And my, the first year I did it, there were so few good producers in DC that I was doing like two or three wines from the same producer to get 10 good dry Lambruscos. And now that that's not the case in DC whatsoever. Although, as I was joking with you earlier, if you're in Montgomery County shopping for Lambrusco in retail, uh, Ed Hardy is stocked there, which is also, uh, do not recommend the Ed Hardy Lambrusco. But that is um, so, you know, you have some, you know, really fascinating celebrity uh, Lambrusco endorsers. Uh, it should be said that, and, and we, we love this, we love our celebrity wines. Um, you know, my personal favorite is uh, the John Bon Jovi Rosé, which is called Hampton Water. Uh, my second favorite um, is uh, the Raekwon, the chef. Um, so this is a uh, Wu-Tang Lambrusco. Uh, uh, Raekwon uh, is called the chef, um, developed his own Lambrusco. Uh, it is a touch sweet, but you know, he felt like he wanted to make an immigrant wine because to him, you know, Staten Island, um, you know, which, which plays this mythical, um, you know, kind of role in the Wu-Tang mythology has this immigrant ethos vis-a-vis you know, Manhattan and the other boroughs. So, um, you know, Lambrusco is ultimate underdog um, that way in, you know, um, you know, really, really awesome fashion. So um, we kind of skipped past, um, you know, a little more like technical gossip. 
um, for the sake of how these wines are actually produced. And I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Um, so um, I want to talk over um, the first uh, two rosés I have in front of me. Um, and, you know, I want to make sure that I give proper um, time and space to tasting notes. So um, I kind of play fast and loose with tasting notes because, you know, for me, you know, the experience of wine is, is hugely subjective. And, you know, I you know, want to be careful about dictating tasting notes to a broader audience because the mere fact of me telling you that this tastes a certain way will inherently prejudice you, um, you know, to perceive the same, same set of flavors that, that I taste. And, you know, we're dealing with a very abstract, imprecise language. My favorite, you know, kind of analogy for the sake of tasting wine is uh, this, you know, great Zappa quote, uh, Frank Zappa, that, you know, uh, dancing about, or sorry, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. And I feel like, you know, tasting wine is, is the same way. But, you know, by the same uh, token, you know, I know that a lot of you, you know, want to, um, you know, get our take on the tasting notes for these wines. So, you know, I want to, you know, come at this, you know, from, you know, both sides. So um, first and foremost, we're going to take this uh, wine from Cleto Chiarli. And uh, uh, Kroll is familiar with this. And I imagine this was one of the producers that you're probably featuring two wines from back in the day. Um, they are one of the oldest producers in uh, Medina. Um, started as a restaurant that was making wine um, in the 19th century. And, um, you know, they started to essentially bottle um, their wines that they were, you know, very successful selling through the restaurant. Um, stylistically, very modern, um, you know, so you're filtering your wine. Um, it is made in what is called the Charmat method. So um, that is the Prosecco method you he see here. Um, you're dealing with a fermentation, um, a secondary fermentation for the sake of introducing gas to the wine that's taking place under pressure in a large tank. Um, and you tend to get, you know, a product that is crisper and cleaner because of that. And, you know, for me, um, you know, the tasting notes on this wine are, you know, consistent with that. This is from Grasparoso and Pinot Nero, Pinot Nero, aka Pinot Noir. Um, this is super floral. It spends less than a day on the skins, is, you know, essentially rosé but it is fuller in body than you would typically expect of uh, like a, a rosé champagne. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, this fun halfway house for me between, you know, that lighter sparkling wine and something more sturdy and substantive for the sake of honest to God, uh, Lambrusco. And then on top of that, it has this like Chantilly cream kind of like, you know, breakfast pastry thing. It reminds me of my dad making me, um, you know, breakfast strudel for some reason that I can't like fully, you know, wrap my head around, but you know, wine has that like evocative power. Um, and then um, the second one up is a personal favorite. This is Fiorini, um, another historic producer in the region, but this is made in what's called the method ancestral. Um, so you have one continuous fermentation. The wine is bottled early before fermentation has totally finished. And uh, there's leftover yeast, leftover sugar in the bottle and under pressure, fermentation finishes and um, you're left with a, a lighter bead in the wine and something that's cloudy um, and typically more savory um, as well. Um, and uh, this one smells quite different. It, it has a little bit of that gym socks kind of, you know, um, you know, quality to it. And uh, Brent spoke, you know, really, you know, directly to that whole Lambrusco cured meat connection. And this like is hugely evocative uh, when it comes to that. Uh, Kroll, um, you know these two wines, I, I would imagine. You know, what do you like about them both, and what do you like about the producers? So, um, Cleto Chiarli, um, this is like an example of, for me, not like a micro producer where you say they're in a garage making like a couple hundred cases or something. I mean, they're a big one, one you can find. But then again, like, they're making really high quality. So I think it's good a lot of times when you can tell people like, hey, here's a Lambrusco that you should be able to find readily available, but they're making really high quality stuff. Um, for me, their Sorbara, it kind of gets this like almost like pink starburst kind of like strawberry type thing to it. It cleans up really nicely in the palate, but how that goes really well too is, you know, not just cured meat, but cured meat that has spice to it, something with a little bit of fire to it. I mean, I like to hold, you know, pair this up against, um, but I, I just generally like their stuff. They have a whole range uh, of different like, you know, rosé and, you know, red from uh, grass Grossa and stuff that I think is... Uh, really like speaks to the varietal. So I think these two producers, I think as much as any producers there are, when you see a certain varietal Lambrusco and when you taste what's in the bottle there, um, they're giving you like a classic example. And I think that a lot of times the um, Fiorini is a little bit smaller. Um, they're a hundred year old uh, co-female run uh, winery with a Christina Fiorini who's in town a lot. 
And this for me gets kind of like these, um, almost like a balsamic or these this kind of a, yeah. it's like um, this kind of almost like savory, but sour, like black fruit type of notes. Um, the Grasparosa from Fiorini is probably the, the Lambrusco that I consume more than any other Lambrusco that there is. I really just enjoy how classic it is. And to your point that you said earlier, these aren't wines you really have to like overthink. They're wines that you unwind with and you don't have to like really wax poetic on them. So much as I'd love to tell you like 20 descriptors about like my childhood that like relate to these wines and it, it, they're just very, they're straightforward and delicious in like a really good way. They're, they're wonderfully undemanding. And it, it reminds me of, you know, so having worked harvest with winemakers, you know, at the end of the day, winemakers rarely unwind with, you know, their own wine. Um, you know, usually people will throw around a few bottles and there'll be some fun parlor tricks for the sake of blind tasting, but people are drinking beer because they want to turn off. And, you know, um, our, our colleague, Matthew Ramsey, has a whole uh, podcast around shipped drinks. You know, this idea of something that you drink to unwind at the end of the day. And that's not, that's, that is very rarely, you know, the, you know, most uh, complicated, you know, attenuated you know, um, life altering wine in the world, you know, it's something that allows you to turn off. It's something that, you know, licenses you to just enjoy something at face value. You know, it's like, you know, going home and unwinding with Citizen Kane. That is preposterous. You know, I want to unwind with Step Brothers. Um, you know, and this is like a little more like the Step Brothers of wine um, in a delightful way. Um, it should be said, we also have La Colina, uh, the Rosa Luna in the mix. Um, I love that wine. Um, that is uh, Salamino um, on the skins um, for a, a little less time. What I love about that wine is what it embodies for the sake of the winemaking. So these are both two kind of slightly larger estates. Uh, for those of you that have um, the, uh, the Rosa Luna um, and La Colina, that embodies this kind of newer, but you know, by the same sense, older tradition of this multi-use farm. Um, you know, this biodynamic movement where you know, um, vine growing is one small part of the larger agricultural whole. Um, and, you know, that's something that we'll bring more in of. But, you know, that is this true art, like artisan uh, product for that winery. And what I love about La Colina is everything they do is whistle clean. So that wine is actually made in the Charmat method. Um, so, you know, there's nothing inherently evil about making wine tank if you do it well. Um, this is actually in its own way, you know, a little more artisanal in terms of the production process than the, the La Colina. But, you know, by the same token, you know, they're both very reflective of a sense of place. And, you know, they're both, you know, just like fabulously uh, delicious uh, and easy drinking. Um, Zoe, we've left you out of the mix here. Uh, do you have any questions or comments from the commentariat for either of us? Yeah, absolutely. So if there's so much yeah, so bad quality Lambrusco, particularly these Ed Hardy examples, where should we go in DC to find our, our good, dry, quality Lambrusco? In the bedroom. Um, actually, bars sell wine to go now, so you should support um, bars. Yeah, so um, I, you should, so exactly. So um, Brent is selling wine. You're selling wine through both locations, are you not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, Kroll uh, is selling wine through Maxwell Park, um, the original Maxwell Park, which is right by the convention center, and then his new location, um, uh, uh, which is, uh, so you have wine out of, do you have wine out of the new bar as well as yeah. the front? They both, they both sell wine to go off the entire list that we list and we discount it to go. And the one in Navy Yard is right by like Chloe and Blue Jacket. It's at like 4th Street uh, Southeast, kind of close to like the, probably like a 10 minute walk from the baseball stadium. And then yeah, saw by the convention center, but they should get Lambrusco from YouTube. I appreciate the plug. You're uh, a great promoter there. I love that comment that's talking about words per minute. I I feel like we both maybe get told to slow down sometimes and someone uh, totally called this out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we both we both do that naturally table side because we get excited about things and uh, you know, we just kind of fast forward the uh, you know, agenda agenda in our own head. Um, you know, it, it should be said too that you know, the fact that we can't historically sell out of our restaurants is just this relic of prohibition, which started well over 100 years ago. And I think that's, you know, something that Brent and I would both love to do in perpetuity. Um, you know, so please, you know, let people know as much. Um, you know, uh, we are, you know, I've done enough cross promotion for the sake of our wine store. I'm not gonna bore anyone with that. You know, in terms of retail outlets selling cool sparkling wine, Domestique kills it. Um, they have a lot of really awesome pet gnats. Rebecca is a shit. 
Um, they're just great people. Um, I would love to pour it any and all business their way that I can. Um, you know, but sadly, I, I think, you know, Lambrusco is one of those things that retail has just like yet to come around on. Um, you know, I do digging for those of you that aren't participating locally every week. And it was really dispiriting, you know, in trying to find wines outside of New York, California, DC, trying to find Lambrusco. So like, you know, your major national sites, you know, wine.com, um, you know, your, um, you know, total wines of the world. They're stuck in this like Riamite 80s place where the Lambrusco they're stocking is from some massive co-op and tastes like Robitussin with bubbles, you know? And, you know, that's not where we want to live. And, you know, for me, the other cool thing about these wines is you can get Lambrusco that's as good as shitty Lambrusco at the same price. Like you don't have to pay up for Lambrusco. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. And, you know, that, you know, just really mm -hmm. elevates it, um, mm -hmm. you know, for me. Uh, it, it, it is a wine for the people. It democratizes wine and it's priced democratically uh, as well. So. I was saying how with Lambrusco too, that like, you know, there's like, we, we've mentioned Rio Needy a lot. We've mentioned a bunch of like shitty Lambrusco and how it's kind of like paved the way for just this whole bad kind of evil category in general. But there is a silver lining to that. I mean, right now in life, we can find silver linings to everything. But when everyone thinks that something sucks, you get a good deal. And, yeah. and a lot of people think that Lambrusco totally sucks. And this is from restaurants having one on there that they don't sell fast enough and you get stale Lambrusco. Or it's like, most of the time it should be consumed pretty fresh. So sometimes it's in the market too long. Uh, bad retail representation, mediocre restaurant representation a lot of the time. So that, what that means is like when you get a great bottle and it's in retail and it's priced like in a really everyday price point, it's because it's in this, I, I think, a little bit of a golden era where everyone thinks it sucks and the quality has gotten better and better. Yeah, and in terms of the region as well, it should be said that you're in a golden era. So, you know, you had this cater of, younger winemakers coming up and reviving the, you know, more kind of artisanal uh, production processes that, you know, existed centuries ago. And, you know, there is, as Brent spoke to, more and more um, wine available in a market like this that is absolutely well worth drinking and bone dry and, you know, savory and transcendentally delicious. Um, and, you know, that is, you know, absolutely well worth celebrating. And I think you know, leaning into those things that are unfashionable will always serve you well as a wine drinker. Um, you know, leaning into those things that are misunderstood, you know, will always serve you. Well, you're going to find value there. You're not going to find value in Napa Cab. You know, it, it's just a lot, it's a lot harder. Um, but, you know, in Lambrusco, in Riesling, you know, in a million other things, you know, that are underappreciated, you know, there's great value to be had. What else you got, though? Um, are any of the Lambruscos still amphora age? Uh, none that I know of. I, I imagine there are producers working in amphora. Um, we do have a, sorry? I think Sayeti through. through yeah, the, yeah. The, so, um, so Sayeti is a producer. He's a, he was, uh, Lambrusco Sayeti is kind of one of the, the first producers to, you know, harken back to the ancestral method um for you know the sake of really traditional uh production he works um more with a grape called salamino um in a, there are many sub kind of appellations for lambrusco he works out of uh, salamino di canta croce um i love his wines that come with this like denim jean kind of uh label that's delightful um they're a little harder to come by um i, I hope to stock them at the store um they're what i call day one wines um, in the sense that if you leave them in the fridge overnight, they tend to get a little, um, you know, mousy um, uh, in a way that's not always enjoyable, but they're, they're, they're really, they are fabulous. Um, I haven't tried his in 4 age offerings. Um, I agree with what you said. I, I've gotten bottle variation. I bet sometimes they've tasted better than others. I mean, it's kind of like what you can run into in the natural category sometimes. It's, it's more and more of like a weird one. Like the Chiarli and the Fiorini, those are like, tried and true you're gonna get consistency like classic product if you go to like Sayeti, there's like a fabric label on it and he used to be an egg farmer and he does amphora he, you know very non-intervention he but... went he went door to door selling it it was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so there is like a, an emergence of like kind of 
weird wines in the Lambrusco category too. I mean, like weird, like creative, like more normal. But I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I, I would say that you know the natural wine movement is is part and parcel of you know the revival of these artisanal styles there, and it's really important to the revival of traditional styles there. And it should be said that you know you're in and so the the Po River Valley, the Po um, uh, runs um, kind of throughout um, in the center of. Uh, the Emilia Romagna region, and it's really defined by um, the the river um, uh, from one side to the next. Um, and uh, it was famously polluted. Um, Milan actually didn't have a sewage treatment plant until very recently, which is horrifying. You're dealing with industrial agriculture after World War II, um, and people aren't, you know, considering what's best for the land. And, you know, in as much as the natural wine movement has become prone to excesses and prone to Jacobins who are, you know, willing to die on that no sulfur cross. It was a necessary corrective for those, you know, excesses of, you know, um, environmental degradation and overuse of chemical treatments and all these other things that, you know, really have no place in, um, you know, artisanal wine production. Um, and, you know, Amelia Romagna has seen a real revival of, um, you know, smaller um, wineries, smaller, um, you know, kind of multi-use farms for the sake of people like La Colina, just wanting to make wines in the spirit of the earth. And, and I think another thing that the natural wine movement doesn't get credit enough for is, you know, A, the spirit of just kind of je ne sais quoi. There's a spirit within natural wine of, you know, you know, let's have fun with this. You know, let's make wine not stodgy. Um, you know, let's wait, make wine, let's, let's make it an agricultural product and not something that, you know, people, you know, are treating as a commodity. Um, you know, and, and also there's this, you know, uh, you know, spirit of uh, innovation um, as well there. And, 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 you know, that's part and parcel with this, you know, kind of return to historical traditions. So, you know, in as much as it's prone to excesses, you know, um, you know it's very necessary um, uh, by the same uh, token. So um, that brings us to actually a wine that I don't have here. I'm gonna switch gears for the sake of the red wines, uh, the Policello. Um, so uh, those of you lucky enough to come by it have a method ancestral wine from uh, Lambrusco de Grasparoso, um, which is re represented here. Um, and this is a single vineyard Grasparoso. This one is made um, in the Charmat method, but it comes from almost 50 year old vines. Um, it's one of my favorite um, Lambruscos in the region, comes in from Kermit Lynch. Um, it's hugely herbal um, in a way that I, I really love. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Kroll talked about, you know, these um, emotional associations we attach to wine. For me with these wines, it's always Easter egg dying. Sounds really weird, but um, for those of you that have done it, you know, you have to drop these like color tablets in vinegar. Um, and uh, smelling Lambrusco always reminds me of being in my grandparents' basement and dying Easter eggs for, for whatever reason. But that's my, you know, Lambrusco association. Uh, Kroll, what do you love about Grosparoso and having tried um, you know, this particular Grasparosa, what do you think about it? Um, for me, for that, for like uh, Grasparosa, that one, I, so I think that like Grasparosa is a grape in general. So sometimes you can have them where they're a little bit, I mean, they're, they're always going to be fairly dark in color, but sometimes they can be a little bit more delicate. And I think sometimes like the variance in flavor can be to darker fruit to, to uh, well, structurally more tannin. And sometimes, like I said, it'll have like this balsamic or almost shrub type quality to it. This is, I think, backing off that a little bit more so than the Fiorini yeah. probably did. So I would say that is like a variance. But, but I I think that like they're, th these are the types of wines where I like these specifically with like prosciutto or brassola or, or those certain types of like meat. So I, I look at these as, or actually even like a steak off the grill right now. If you're oh, like, yeah, 100%. And, and for me, it, it brings you back to that, like, Lambrusco's ultimate barbecue wine thing. I want, like, I want meat with fat. You know, I want fat with these wines. You know, uh, the that tannic grip, you know, will cut through all that. Um, you know, I want West Texas smoke, you know, with sauce on the side. You know, I want all those things with these wines. Uh, and, you know, I, I love those, you know, kind of strange bedfellows. You know, there's no way that, you know, some pit master in West Texas was ever, you know, thinking about Lambrusco when he was firing up, you know, the, you know, mesquite, you know, grill, but, you know, they work together. The synergy is, is really, you know, amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, for this one in particular, um, it's also high tone. So grass grows, it's a great for the hills. Um, the soils tend to be poorer there um, than they are in the plains. And, you know, in spite of, you know, it's tannic grip, you know, I think for this wine, you know, there's something like delicate and floral um, about it that's, that's really, you know, quite lovely. 
um, as well. Um, the other wine we're drinking here is uh, Lini uh, 910. And I wanted to pull up a picture of uh, the family that makes this, because this is a, another one that's rooted in tradition. And I love this family photo. So uh, this is a Lini 910 family. Um, it looks like uh, Amelia Romagna's succession um, in the best possible way. Um, you know, I'm wondering, you know, I want to like personify each person like in the succession mold and figure out like who is the Rupert Murdoch, who is the, you know, first son, uh, et cetera. But I want to celebrate uh, this. It should be said that the woman in the leather couch um, is like really kind of like the become the face of the brand. Um, you know, but, you know, what an amazing picture. We should all be uh, so lucky uh, to share, you know, such lineage. But, um, you know, a lot of these older producers um, are, are very much rooted in tradition. Um, uh, this particular wine um, is a blend of Salamino and Ancelotto. We haven't talked Ancelotto at all. Ancelotto is a, a local grape that very often is used in smaller percentages to lend additional color um, to the wine. Um, and for me, this one leans even more in that balsamic direction. It's actually like a little less delicate um, uh, and pretty than the Grosparoso. Um, uh, and a little more of that like, you know, full umami twang uh, to it, uh, but in, you know, a really, you know, kind of uh, fabulous uh, way. Um, and, you know, it should be said that these are, you know, slightly more widely available um, offerings as opposed to the, the niche um, kind of artisanal bottlings. Um, Brent, are there any other, you know, pairings that you've arrived at for the sake of wines like this that, you know, have surprised you over the course of your career with Lambrusco? Um, I mean, some of the cheese pairings, I think, are super underrated. Like, I can't think of any restaurant I've ever gone to where they paired Lambrusco and cheese for me. Um, but especially some of those hard, like, high, like, I mean, aged Parmesan is kind of like the obvious one from there. But I've actually got into this with, like, Gruyere or Pecorino or things like that, where like different members just line up with it. I think the, the Lini uh, is one of the, I think it's the only good white Lambrusco I've ever had. I've, I've only had a few though, but that, that's not very common too. I would honestly really like to play around with pairing with that. I'm kind of, I'm not really sure uh, how that would go, but I do like the, um, specifically more so in the Salamina, the uh, the delicacy of the Grasparosas with like semi-firm, like acidic, uh, or, or to hard cheeses. Yeah, and I, I could see, you know, for the sake of cheese, like this even going with, um, you know, something like a blue or even, you know, um, you know, some of the, so Lambrusco comes in many shapes and sizes for the sake of sweetness. So these are, you know, predominantly secco or dry Lambruscos, but there's this whole style called the Mobile, um, which is kind of subtly sweet. And those are killer cheese wines. Those are killer like Thai food wines. Um, you know, I think about like Stilton or Valdeon or these other, you know, Gorgonzola Dolce is just like a really natural fit and kind of like an off dry red Lambrusco just being absolutely gangbusters uh, together. I also think maybe that Lini 910 with like the fried chicken you guys have been selling would be pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, if you, you could get into kind of like deeper, like I'm trying to think like some of that Chico food, I could throw a Grasparosa against that or a Salamino. Yeah, they're, I mean, like the, the Euros love to say that they're gastronomic wines. And I think, I think too, and, and, and Kroll, maybe you can speak to this, but, um, you know, you guys ask a lot about pairings for the sake of our wines. And I think, you know, for those of us in the business, we're a little more like kid Icarus about it. I think we're willing to, you know, just kind of try shit out. Um, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But um, I encourage you all to, to do the same. You know, I, I am continually surprised by what works and what doesn't, you know, for the sake of our menu at Tail of Goat today. You know, I, I was trying out this like kind of spicier halibut dish. I ended up going with this Canary Island red wine that I wouldn't have, you know, imagined in a million years, you know, would be, you know, kind of this like, you know, yin meat yang kind of synergy. But you know, paired beautifully. Um, and, you know, those are my favorite moments with food and wine. It's, it's not necessarily the, you know, um, you know, the check box, you know, I thought this would work, you know, kind of more derivative stuff. It's the, oops, I happen to have this open, you know, let's give it a try, you know, kind of, kind of things. And Lambrusco is the ultimate, let's give this a shot kind of pairing wine. Yeah, I think the cool thing with pairing too is like, it doesn't take a sommelier certification. Like anyone on the Zoom could teach either one of us about a pairing that works that we would have never even thought about. So it's cool to just, you know, play around in that sense too. 
Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and, and also, like, I think the, the joy of it is just getting a sense of how the things play together. And, you know, there is no platonic ideal of pairing. You know, um, there are, you know, equally valid, you know, wine and food pairings for the same dish that vibrate on different wavelengths that will, you know, tease out, you know, a different specific flavor in one dish as opposed to uh, another. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's, it's really fun to explore, um, you know, further uh, those connections in, in more, you know, kind of profound ways. And, and you know, that is my favorite thing about wine, wine and food pairing, you know, it's not dictating, you know, as some kind of like pairing pope, you know, what, you know, shall be and what, what shall not be. You know, it's not like a you can't wear white after Labor Day kind of thing vis-a-vis -vis pairings. You know, it, it's more of a, you know, here are my ideas about what I like to eat with this. But, you know, I want you to build your own sandbox, you know. And I think at the end of the day for both of us, you know, it's about um, empowering people to love wine in their own way. Whatever you love about it, you know, because we're not going to eat the same shit that you all do, you know. Um, but, you know, hopefully you come up with, you know, these like wild uses for Lambrusco that we never would have imagined uh, otherwise. Like that is, you know, that's the moment, you know, that that is like, for me, you know, the growth moment as, you know, somebody that does that is, you know, someone coming back and say, I tried this with X or Y that I made. And it's something that I never would have thought of, you know, trying Lambrusco with. Those are the, those are the most rewarding, you know, kind of types of feedback that, that I get um, for the sake of these ones. Yeah, I'd, I'd say like when I was at uh, Iron Gate or when I worked for like Alain Ducasse, I would always line up pairings that made sense and pairings that made no sense. And I would say probably much statistically, maybe like one out of five times, well, it's something that made no sense would beat out everything else. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a high percentage. Yeah, and I think, I think like those are the most interesting pairings. And I, I talk about like, you know, having like uh, as a, you know, person that's doing this, it's just like having the strength of your own convictions, you know, and, and, you know, not worrying about what people think of, you know, a, um, you know, kind of uh, mishmash as, as such and just, you know, letting it live on its own and, and you know, letting people uh, explore that for themselves. And, you know, those end up being much more rewarding, hopefully, um, experiences for, you know, the people experiencing, you know, food and wine than the ones that feel much more derivative. Um, so what do you got for us? Uh, well, first, just a request, Brent. Um, the words per minute is uh, more helpful if we can see your hands because that's. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you wouldn't mind just um, getting your camera a little bit better. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, gesticulating. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, we have um, a lot of people talking about how the Fiorini is a little bit orange, and if there's something specific about the grape varietals or about the vinification that has made that like more orange and amber-like color. Uh, that has everything to do with the fact that it's unfiltered. Um, so that is a wine that rests on the leaves and they do not um, disgorge. So for those of you playing along at home, um, when you make a sparkling wine, you're dealing with, um, for the sake of, um, regardless of what you're dealing with. So you uh, cap the, uh, the wine in bottle uh, for the sake of something like the Fiorini early. So we pop a cork, we pop, typically it wouldn't be a cork, it would be like a, a bottle cap uh, on this. Um, and it finishes uh, fermentation under pressure, uh, but as it finishes, it dispels um, uh, leftover dead yeast and other sediment that rests at the bottom of the bottle. And typically at the end of the winemaking process, um, in order to clarify it, um, they will um, disgorge. So they will rest the bottle on its edge, um, uh, inverted, you know, this way, um, and turn it, uh, it's a process called brumage, um, and uh, the sediment will work its way toward the neck. Um, they'll uh, kind of uh, subsume it in an ice bath and uh, a little plug worth of uh, frozen sediment will be disgorged uh, and then they'll pop a, uh, a cork on it thereafter to create something, you know, whistle clean and clear. They haven't done that for the sake of this wine, uh, which is why it has the color that it does. And then um, this is a point that I meant to make earlier, but it's also why it has a texture that it does. So I think that, you know, people talk a lot about tasting notes when it comes to wine. I think specifically with Lambrusco, which has this added element of CO2, um, that textural, you know, piece is 
is really fabulous. Um, you know, and you know that that moose. Um, you know that you know uh, uh, laziness. Um, you know um, that savoriness for the sake of um, the Fiorini, which you know for me is is, is an outlier. Um, for the rest of these wines that you know were disgorged, um, is something special and we're celebrating um, alongside any other tasting notes that you could you know potentially throw at it. So um, you know that is that is a big part of why it has the color uh, that it does. Um, are there any Lambruscos that are worth cellaring? I've, I've, I've heard a debate on some of this. I've seen some uh, champagne method. Um, Champagne method sorbaras or uh, secondary fermentation bottle uh, sorbaras that are what's the it's Cantina del Volte is the one where they age it uh, I think about five years before they release into the market um, I I think young and fresh is stylistically like what I even look for even trying aged ones but I've only seen one where it's like purposely aged <laughs> purposely <laughs> even considered a uh, a high, like a higher end Lambrusco, which I think that one would probably retail for like around $30. And like, yeah, it's got about five years on it, but I can't think of one other than that. I, I play fast. So for me, the notion of ageability in wines is fundamentally flawed. Um, and it's something that I like to play fast and loose with. Um, I don't think there's anything more intrinsically ageable about a lot of champagnes and a lot of these Lambruscos. The things that make wine age well, um, you know, are, alcohol and acidity first and foremost and you know people would prejudice alcohol but I would you know augur that acidity is foremost um you know for the sake of sparkling wine people tend to prejudice time on the lees um as as Kroll said there are a lot more producers working with extended elevage of Lambrusco and extended um time on the lees for the sake of the Lambruscos which means that you know they tend to be you know um releasing them much later um than historically they would have um, you know, and, and again, this is just about like the love of wine. Um, you know, I want to know what happens to these wines as they age, especially something like the Fiorina. So the fact that this is aged on the lees as it is means that it's essentially a living product. You know, the lees biologically are still kind of alive with, um, you know, dead yeast. And that will preserve this wine and, um, you know, serve as a ballast against spoilage in a way that these other kind of more, um, you know, safe filtered products do not have. Um, and I would love to try this five years from now. I think it would be fucking awesome. You know, it would have a little less like primary fruit. It would taste a little more like briny, um, but I think like texturally be like wildly interesting and super cool and still hugely enjoyable. It would just be enjoyable in a different way. Um, and, you know, again, like I, I you know, good wine will age. It doesn't matter what it is, you know? It's like talking about, you know, we were having this conversation here earlier. It's like talking about like people who say, I wouldn't spend, you know, a hundred dollars for, you know, a Thai tasting menu or a Mexican tasting menu or whatever. It's like, fuck off. Like the, the cuisine is good. If the food's good, then, you know, pay for it. If the wine's good, then, you know, see what happens in a few years, you know? Good is good. Game respects game. If the wine is well made, it's going to age well. End of story. Like, you know, get after it. That's Amen. Yeah. Great. What else you got, Zoe? Oh, um, do you think that this, uh, that there's bubbles in red wine mainly because of vinification from like primitive times? Like it was just done by accident and I mean, like, bubbles are, bubbles are going to happen. I mean, CO2 is going to happen. You know, CO2 mm -hmm. happens, you know, like, like, you know, I mean, every... Sorry. I know, no right, but like, so it, it should be said that I think Lambrusco is not alone in Italy. So, like, this style of wine exists throughout, like, northern, exists throughout northern Italy in particular, and it's called kind of vivace. Um, it's like the vivace style of wine. And, and typically it was, like, about your uncle bottled his wine a little too early. And then the next spring, you know, it had a little fizz to it. And people liked that for the sake of freshness. So it's something like very artisanal and very homespun, but it exists everywhere in Italy in particular. Um, you know, it exists in, you know, Campania, it exists, you know, everywhere. Like Emilia Romagna in particular is like a bit of a hotbed, you know, for the sake of this style of like re-fermentation, but it's not unique. 
Um, you know, in the modern era, it's important to denote that, you know, wine in bottle has only existed in bottle um, for the sake of glass that could withstand that level of pressure for two and a half centuries, three centuries, maybe two centuries for the sake of Italy. Um, so it's a relatively recent, you know, thing. But ever since people have been bottling wine there, wine has re-fermented unintentionally and people have liked it or not liked it. And it just so happens that in this corner of Italy, they've liked it a lot. And I think we're just kind of starting to re-explore that. And actually like, um, a lot, in as much as people like Lambrusco, actually the noble grape of Emilia Romagna historically was Barbera for reds. And a lot of people love Barbera with a little bit of fizz to it. And a lot of people are re-exploring that again. And, you know, I'm excited to taste more of those wines. There's, you know, one in particular called Juternio Frizzante that's really lovely. It's up in the hills um, in like the western corner of Emilia Romagna. But there's always been like fizzy red wine in Italy. Kroll, you want to add? No, I, I think it's going to be, if I were to have a crystal ball for wine in the next like five or 10 fizzy cold reds are going to be one of the I think coolest new categories that you're going to see and I think that it is very easy for them to do it even if they wanted to have like a little bit of fizz I mean there's that's like when you ferment you have to rack essentially to like get rid of it so I mean I don't, I don't think that pertains to the actual question but I think having just a little bit of a prickle or even doing like Bizante, uh, I see that category like blowing up soon yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's going to blow up to the extent that anybody's going to make, like, real money off it. Like, so I don't know if it's going to be, like, trading on NASDAQ. So, like, I feel like Kroll, like, if Kroll and I were brokers, we would probably, like, double down on our lightly effervescent Italian red wine stocks. But I don't think either of us is going to become rich that way. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think people will start drinking more of it, you know, and it will bring joy to lives, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, I've even seen, like, what is it, Early Mountain in Virginia started doing a red pet knot they make a little of. It's really good. And, like, you've seen these, like, wines, like, and for me, like, these red pet knots when I see them are, I think, maybe inspired by Dryland Brusco in a certain way or or maybe, you know, War Valley, what they do with pet knots. But I, I'm liking what I'm seeing in the category a lot. Yeah, so it should be said that, like, in as much as I love to visit local wineries, I love to tell, especially in Virginia, uh, winemakers to turn their, um, you know, either mediocre or good petite Bordeaux into great, you know, fizzy petite Bordeaux. So I'm a huge, like, you know, you can do this well, but you can't do it well enough to be like, you know, ridiculous, you know, add some bubbles to it, just make it fun. Um, you know, and you know, I would love to see more people making wine like that and more people drinking wine like that, honestly. What else you got, Joe? Why do you think all these celebrities are investing in Lambrusco? Maybe <laughs> exactly what you're saying, you know? um, I, don't, I don't know. Kroll? Uh, it's penny stocks right now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're like a celebrity mogul and it's just like, hey, you want to get into Lambrusco, I think this is like when you're starting to see people in California like get involved in South America on the cheap. It's just like, you look at places of the world where you can like get involved with nothing. And you also look at things like the rap culture and how it saves stuff like cognac. And if you're like a rapper and you have ties like that, you can kind of like uplift a whole category like for your product. So I think buying in on the cheap is huge motivation there. Yeah, I think, I think like, <laughs> I, I like the idea of, you know, any, celebrity likes the idea of having a brand, you know, like loves the idea of, you know, extending their portfolio into wine. And, and you know, it is much easier to do that in um, Lambrusco than it is in Champagne. So, you know, um, like Hova has Ace of Spades, but that was a much bigger lift than um, Raekwon's Lambrusco, <laughs> which, you know, gives you a sense of, you know, the market share that they, they each occupy. Um, but, you know, I, I hope it's because more people are drinking Lambrusco, honestly, uh, at, at the end of the day. Um, you know, I, you know, wine is weird. Like it's a, as a branding entity, it is essentially a luxury good um, for, for a lot of people and celebrities love to tie their names to, to luxury goods. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I feel like the more celebrities, I don't want to encourage celebrities to invest in Lambrusco, but I want to encourage people in general to invest in Lambrusco. So like if 
like Spectre Deck, Raekwon the Chef, You God, Ghostface Killer, you know, Method Man, you know, each had their own, like if it was like Meth's Ross Barroso, and like, you know, you had, um, I, I don't know, if you had like each member of the Wu Kang Clan, you know, Red Man was like Sorbara, you know, doing their own Lambrusco, I would totally, you know, be into that. And I would say you get a little gentler with Sorbara, maybe you're into Lupe Fiasco, and then you go all the way oh, to the that's very, that's very good. All, all, the, all the way to like the weekend, super soft for the- Yeah, weekend. well we talk, we had, a, there's an extensive, um, you know, discussion uh, in the chat about personifying grapes as different wrappers uh, earlier. Um, it's different Lambrusco sub varietals is, is, even, is even nerdier uh, than that. But uh, yeah, I, mean, I would love to see uh, like a Wu-Tang family of Lambruscos. I don't want Raekwon to be the only, you know, former Wu-Tang member with a, a Lambrusco brand. That's actually a really good segue to another question, which is how the flavor profiles differ between like the main varietals in Lambrusco. S significantly. Um, yeah, sig significantly. Um, you know, so I think people are just starting to get a full sense of how they differ genetically. Um, uh, Kroll, Kroll has, you know, um, you know, better experience with this, but like Gras Barossa is very much the king of varietals in terms of like its tannic grip and then Sorbara is kind of like at the other end of the spectrum in terms of, um, you know, more feminine and floral and, you know, the other varietals in between. Um, can you speak to kind of typicity there, Brent? I've actually seen, yeah, so I, I typically get um, like Salamino to be very inky and Gras Barossa to be slightly more floral, but for me, what I link this to is like, do you know how sometimes you can see like a Nebbiolo or a Sangiovese or like some of these grapes? Or I've even seen it with like something more obscure like Mavro Dragono and like Santorini, where someone making it can do like a super light version and then someone making it can do like a super heavy version. Actually, you can apply that to a lot of regions and stuff. So for me, it's like, it's hard to tell people that like, um, for me, it's hard to tell people that, uh, you know, Grasparosa or Salamino or one is such like a powerhouse compared to the other. The uh, Ian Daggett grape book is the only one that I've really seen get into the varietals and information. So if you could have that book or look it up or get it on Amazon, that I think is the best Italian grape book that I've found for reading about these. Yeah, I mean, but, but I find it's like it's better. So like the, the wholesale reference being like the Jancis Robinson uh, wine grapes book, but yeah. does not do a lot of favors to the Lambrusco family. It's, uh, so I, I would say like grass grocer selling, you know, I've seen them depending on producer where one's bigger than the other, they can both kind of like interchangeably be as powerful. But I, I would say that generally grass Barossa for me is a little more floral and it's just got, uh, I look a little bit more pillowy and I've kind of seen like uh, Salamino be more like inky and astringent and kind of darker. And I think this has like a ton of color to it. And Sorbaras for me, I've seen these be like almost like fizzy and tart, almost like a Provence Rosé. And then I've seen where it just smells like straight up candy on the nose, but finishes like, you know, dry as well. So I've seen the aromatics like range wildly on there. But pretty much if you're going around and you're looking for Lambrusco, uh, not, not to just get into like, you know, there's so many different varieties, you're pretty much going to see Salamino, Grasparosa, and uh, Sorbara almost like exclusively in the market like right now. I don't think that, for at least for me, I don't really see a dominant grape in a Lambrusco, in like a quality Lambrusco outside of those three, hardly ever. And then uh, Kroll, are there other, do you have other favorite producers that we haven't touched on today? that people might like to seek out? You know, I've actually got a bunch of beer nerds who tell me they don't drink wine to try Donati because there's bread yeah. with Anamyces on it. So yeah. the, the beer beer hipsters that love like stank sour beers, I've given Donati and they're like, oh, this is great. And you bridge the gap to the, the beer lovers. Uh, I think- and it says Camilo Donati, for those of you playing at home, who's uh, very much another kind of pioneer for the sake of reviving more artisanal styles of Lambrusco. And it should be said that like, there are these extremes, so you plant a Chiarly, they make whistle clean wines that, you know, are, you know, as shelf stable as anything in the world. And then you have, you know, the maestries of the world that, um, you know, are making wines that taste like, you know, gym socks and, you know, only last a day. I think Donati is, a little more shelf stable than that, but more on the gym soxy side of the ledger. 
Yeah, yeah. And I would say those the Delaney nine ten that, <clears throat> that you have here too is definitely one of my favorites. Um the Candidas El uh Tavolte, the uh the age sorbara that's a champagne method that I mentioned before is definitely a favorite of mine too. Uh I think that they're going a completely different direction with how they age it and you know uh set, you know trying to make it in the champagne method and i think that that's a really cool one i think that they just broke up with their distributors so they might be like out of the market um i actually this is like the time of the year that i go on a hunt for like all lambruscos around here and in like surrounding markets like new jersey and new york to like stock up for lambrusco week so i'm probably like this is a good motivational thing to give me uh so you are the like the lambrusco like great white shark uh as of July for the sake of uh, hoarding things for your future Lambrusco, you know, kind of bacchanal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you have a lot of great choices here. I also think when I was speaking about the consistency of Fiorini that I, I was, uh, to correct myself, uh, was speaking more about their Terra El Sole. And you're, you're offering one that is very new to the market. that has been, I think, been in the market for less than a year, speaking of new good Lambruscos. Yeah, it's, so. it's, 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 it is a, so, and this is, you know, very much a hearkening back to a historic style. They, it's an older, older vineyard. It's a, um, they call it the, the Vigna de Padre. So it's like a, you know, uh, homage to an older style of wine that's made in the method ancestral and bottled without, you know, binding or filtration and, and, you know, really special, um, as, as such. And it's kind of, it's kind of fun. I, I do like that they are, you know, pursuing more artisanal processes. And, and so, you know, you have a lot of times in the industry, you know, um, producers that are small and are trying, they're striving after consistency and you have producers that are consistent and they're striving after typicity, you know, they're striving after, you know, soulful, uh, more soulful wines. And, you know, I, I always feel, you know, heartened when people are moving in the same direction, you know, whether or not they get, you know, quite get there, you know, at least they're, you know, headed uh, the same way. Um, but so before we get to more questions, um, I just wanted to, to thank everybody uh, for joining us and, and toast uh, you all. Uh, Kroll, you're not drinking, uh, but, you know, um, <laughs> thank you so much for, for joining us. And it should be said that Brent, Brent said he was going to be on for uh, 45 minutes and has, has uh, managed to shirk uh, whatever he had uh, going on later this afternoon for the sake of, um, you know, staying on this chat. And uh, Zoe is courageously avoiding any and all service responsibilities. Um, for the sake of uh, <laughs> for the sake of moderating the chat, so um, uh, thank you, thank you all so much. Uh, it's been it's been such a pleasure. Um, we're going to continue to answer questions. Uh, it, it should be said, but uh, I am you know um, thrilled that uh, Lambrusco brings joy to as many of you as it does. And it, it should be said that um, you know uh, I am committed to stocking um, more of these wines and uh, making them more broadly available. Um, uh, Brent, you know. Um, has been doing that longer than I have, and we're not gonna we're not gonna stop, um, you know. Uh, and and I think we're both, you know, true, you know, kind of like jazz record collecting obsessives. It doesn't matter to us whether it earns a living, you know. It just feels like you know the right thing to do. So um, we're we're gonna keep on doing. It. So cheers to you all alone together. Um, as always, thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, what do you have? Um, oh, uh, <laughs> I did kind of want to know. Um, if bubbly wine, fizzy wine is related scientifically to hangovers and to headaches the next day? A um, few things. So yes and no. Um, uh, objectively, you know, it's all the same amount of alcohol, uh, but CO2 does speed the delivery of alcohol to your bloodstream. So it's an accelerant. Um, so it gets you, it, it, will, it, it will increase um, your body's ABV faster, um, which can, you know, cause trouble depending on what you decide to do with your night. I used to have this thing for fun in college when I was uh, much more of an idiot than I am now. There's a sharper image of breathalyzer and I used to oh. like, take a shot and then see like how quick it took to metabolize the alcohol. And it's interesting with carbonation, like it, it, the timer is faster if you yeah. eat even faster than if you do like a shot of like bourbon like you know spark anything sparkling is faster for wow. uh for it making a, a little difference oh wow i didn't even know the sharper image offered that i don't know if they still do probably a bunch of idiots like me <laughs> bought them and then it 
I don't think I don't think there's still a sharper image. I think sharper image is oh. like that. <laughs> wow, that's, that's I'm starting to get back in the day type statements. Yeah, that's yeah. Funny. Which is hugely sad. Um, yeah. What else you got, Zoe? Uh, this is like the nerdiest functional alcoholism. This is funny. Um, what about soil types for Lambrusco varieties? Uh, mostly heavy. Uh, so so uh, you're, I mean, you're in an alluvial plain. Um, so, and, and on, honestly, like, um, it, Lambrusco historically was famous as a productive grape. People lean into that. Um, your heavier soils, especially for the sake of Sorbar and stuff like that, there is some, there's some limestone in the hills for the sake of like Grosparosa, um, you know, which can give you a little more, you know, of like a perfumey kind of like, um, uh, you know, kind of femininity about, about the wines, but, um, it's, it's, I mean, I'm sure that people who are in it talk about terroir um, and think meaningfully about it, but it is not one of those regions that, you know, is famed for it as such, Kroll. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with like kind of what you're saying on the soil. So I think when you're using soils like this, like in, I, I'm sure this has been covered to some extent in these classes, you can't like scientifically like prove or disprove like you know soil or terroir it's like effect in wine but I mean for me some soils have like a minerality that's kind of like isn't like mineral water where it's like fairly neutral so I think that like you're not necessarily smelling like the extreme like kimmeriginous gibli or like the lacrella shift of like pre -erat. like when you're into these soils that Bill described they're they're more of like a neutral like minerality that what how it imparts in the wine so I, I, I oh go ahead I, I would I would quibble though so like there's not a uh Science, I would say, science has yet to suss out the, you know, kind of like organoleptic, you know, kind of flavor profiles that soils ultimately derive. I think that, you know, the deeper you dive into it as a wine nerd, um, the more you become aware that there's so many variables with soil types and geology that even within, you know, adjoining vineyard sites, there, it's, it's, impossible, it's almost impossible to isolate an independent variable. Um, so, you know, you, you just, you, you, you stand, you know, you're, you're humble in the face of the things that you can't, you know, meaningfully differentiate otherwise. Um, but I, I don't think, I think the biggest difference here is, is probably depth of soil, which is something that people don't consider a lot. So, um, you know, like uh, depth of soil and, and, and fertility of soil is hugely important when it comes to soil types. And, you know, if you're in, if you're in the alluvial plains, soil is a lot deeper, um, you know, the, the vines are picking up a lot more nutrients. Uh, they're a lot more productive. Uh, if you're on the hillsides, um, the opposite is true. Um, and I think that's a major divide for the sake of this region is, is hillside or plain. Um, and Grosparosa in particular tends to be great for the hillsides, whereas um, Salamino tends to be great for the plains. But, you know, as Brent said, like there are people growing Salamino on the plains or Salamino on the hills and Grosparosa. So, you know, there are always, like with wine as with life, um, there are always exceptions to the rule. And it's, it's really important to address each wine in as much as, you know, um, you, know you want to consider it as an individual um, and, and, you know, try to understand it on its own terms. That's not all I got that has to do with grapes and wine. What, what else do you have? <laughs> Um, when can we play Lambrusco Pong in terms of beer pong? I think. Oh that yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, I want. Hopefully, distance with that though. I want to make that happen, and I feel like Kroll. I feel like we have to. Uh, I think that could work in, um, you know, just like stout kind of rocks glasses I, or, or solo. They could work in solo cups too. Um, I think that like. Uh, that's a great idea i think that like you know especially with like all these fizzy kind of like praises with all your white claws and truly is throw some lime bruce go into the mix you know like why not why can't that have a seat at the table yeah i, th I think too you would uh you'd have to be like legally obligated to play with the pink ping pong balls i think that would be like an important part of the uh the Lambrusco pong uh experience but i think i think the rules should be the same um you know uh, and and I, I think that sounds like good fun. Um, I once played beer pong with Yinling. It's one of the more traumatic experiences of my life, and I would much rather uh, play with with Lambrusco than than anything else. But um, I don't think there's any like local tradition of Lambrusco pong. 
for what it's worth. Yeah, I don't can't can't think of it. Oh, one thing that you mentioned about soil that I I don't mean to backtrack too much, but like what like in terms of you talked about like vines digging in and stuff. That stuff creates like in terms of the vines struggling and yields, it creates more intensity. And Lambrusco, if there's a common thread when you like are doing a tasting grid or just smelling it, Lambrusco is very rarely if ever lacking intensity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's very, it's actually like very rarely lacking in acidity either, which is uh, typically, which is typically what goes wrong with the reproduction. Typically wines get, you know, kind of vapid and like, you know, you know, uh, they just get kind of wan and like, um, you know, not, you know, they, they get flabby. Um, but that that's not something that happens with Lambrusco. It retains its acid pretty well, regardless of the yields. Um, but, you know, it, it gets, it, it goes into this like Starburst candy place that's not, you know, quite as um, enjoyable. But, um, you know, hopefully that hasn't been the case for the sake of the Lambruscos that you all have been trying today and, um, you know, we hope that you continue to drink it and continue to appreciate it um, as the multifaceted um, beauty um, that it is, you know, essentially thirst quenching, but, you know, wonderfully profound uh, as well. So, um, Crowley, you have anything else to add, buddy? No, someone was asking me my personal life on here, so I answered that on the <laughs> he's, he's, he's a happily married man, uh, you know, with children. Uh, yeah, yeah. With, no. child, with child, yeah. No. yeah. I, anyways, I answered it in the chat. It's going <laughs> um, to make me blush to a Sorbara shade right now. <laughs> uh, great. Yeah, great cross promotion there, buddy. Um, Kroll, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Uh, such, a, such a pleasure. Zoe, you're the best. You're a treasure, um, as always. Um, thank you all. Um, I remember to record so we can, uh, you know, have this lesson for, um, well, ever. Um, and, uh, love you all. Cheers. You guys are incredible. I'm a huge fan of your place. I Like I said to you via email, and I'll say it in front of everyone, uh, lucky to have places like yours in D.C., and thanks for having me on today. Yeah, uh, we feel as lucky to have you, buddy. Take care. Thanks.